Welcome to the How to Be a Successful EM Applicant Clinical Scenarios webinar. I'm Ava Pierce and I'll be your moderator for tonight. Next slide. These are our presenters. We will begin with Dr. Rendon and Dr. Nadation presenting an overview of problem-based learning. Awesome, thank you so much. Hi, I'm Dr. Serena Nation from Duke University, and this is my wonderful colleague, Dr. Mark Rendon from UT Southwest, and we're excited to share with you problem-based Department. And we also want to share some tips and pearls that uh, you can use to help you excel on your emergency medicine clerkship or Next rotation. Slide. And most importantly, by the end of this talk, we're really hopeful that you'll be able to put these puzzle pieces together to realize how to get from that cheap complaint all the way through the workup and really take care of your patients. And we're going to be going through some scenarios to really help you figure this out. Next slide. So Dr. Rendon, why don't we start from the beginning? You know, what exactly is PBL and what is a cheap complaint? What should our students know? Yeah, though, though this may seem basic, um, establishing a chief complaint really is a cornerstone of emergency medicine since we are a complaint-based specialty. And so a chief complaint is essentially the primary reason that a patient seeks care in the emergency department. In other words, why did the patient come to the hospital? And sometimes this may be very simple, very straightforward, like, hey, I rolled my ankle. Uh, but other times it can be a little bit more complex and a little bit more challenging to tease out. And as our students gain more and more clinical experience and have more patient encounters, uh, they'll become more proficient in uh, ascertaining and figuring out exactly what, why the patient presented to the emergency room. And so problem-based learning is essentially our approach, our method, of addressing the patient's chief complaint. The, the problem-based learning really guides our uh, history taking, our uh, focused physical examination, and it, and it also guides our diagnostics and, um, and ultimately the care of the patient in the emergency department. Awesome, that's a great definition. Yeah, so why don't so, we move to the next slide? Yeah, so, so with that in mind, uh, Dr. Nadation, what are some, some of our must-know chief complaints for our students? Well, you know, if you uh, go to the American Board of Emergency Medicine website and try to figure out, you know, what do we need to know as the emergency physicians, um, essentially they tell us we need to know everything, right? We need to know the whole breadth of medicine because we don't know what's going to walk through the doors. Um, but for our students, you know, there are some, um, you know, high acuity and um, kind of most common chief complaints that we could recommend that you should probably get a good handle on. And these include the ones listed here. So chest pain, shortness of breath, headache, abdominal pain, fever, and vomiting. So these are kind of the, the core ones that we would expect that you would have a kind of a working uh, pathway in your mind of how to work up and, and take care of these patients. Um, next slide. So Dr. Renna, you know, if, if EM is so vast, um, what are some ways that our students can really stand out on their rotations? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. You know, I would suggest for our students that one way that they could stand out is really by just emphasizing a fundamental concept. And that is when a student evaluates a patient and they've taken a history, performed a focused problem-based problem um, examination and thought about this patient, I want to have an idea of where they want to go with this patient. I want them to have a good working differential diagnosis and a good plan that includes diagnostics, therapeutics, and even a potential disposition uh, for the patient. So when I hear a student's um, working differential diagnosis, I not only want to hear what's most likely going on, I also want to hear about high-risk, life-threatening conditions that must be ruled out. And I also want to hear about high-risk conditions that, uh, that perhaps they already excluded based off of just their history and physical examination. Yeah, I agree. I think it's helpful for us to know what they've thought about and want to work up and the things that they have already rolled out so really can get into their minds about how they're thinking about it. Next slide. Yeah, so Dr. Nadation, what are some other ways that our students can stand out? 
Well, you know, um, you know, emergency medicine, we really pride ourselves in EM to be a team that's serving our patients. So while the fund of knowledge is really important, the interactions with the patients, the family, the staff, all of that is really important as well. And then also the engagement and involvement in the in the care is really important. So if our students want to, you know, concrete ways to get involved, they can call the skilled nursing facilities for collateral information or the families for collateral information. Um, I know residents love it when medical students will call consults, so that's an easy way to kind of get bonus points, or even just gathering supplies for procedures. Um, those are some of the simple ways. Um, any others that you could think about, Dr. Rendon? Yeah, absolutely. Those are really good points. You know, it, yeah, I would add, um, in addition to hearing, you know, a stellar uh, presentation with a, a great initial assessment and plan. I also really like it when students um, are engaged throughout the entirety of the patient's ED course. That is, I want uh, students to be involved, um, reevaluating the patient. As we all know, uh, and for our students who, if they haven't experienced this, uh, we may have patients who present seemingly stable, and then all of a sudden that things can change. Um, patients, um, unfortunately, but do often uh, decompensate. And so I want our students constantly reevaluating their patients. This really helps them uh, stand out. And also just uh, communicating with uh, the emergency medicine team, any concerns that the patient might have, or, or especially any concerns that the nursing staff might have. Um, oftentimes, the, the nurses our front line and they'll kind of inform us if a patient has any kind of change in their condition. And so um, when, whenever the students chat with our nurses and they relay that information back to us, that can be extremely helpful and it'll really help a student stand out. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so the emergency department is can be a very crazy place. We obviously have uh, time limitations, spatial restrictions, and quite frankly, it can sometimes be a little bit chaotic. So what would you suggest, uh, Dr. Nadation, to our students uh, to know um, when, whenever they need to involve someone more senior? Yeah, I think this is a very important question. You know, for our medical students, you may be the first one to actually walk into a room to see the patient even before your team actually saw them. Um, so really kind of learning that gestalt of sick or not sick can really help your patients. And a couple um, ways that you can do that is, one, look at the vital signs. You know, recognize if they're really tachycardic, and their heart rate's really high or if their blood pressure is really low, those might be patients that you might want to grab your attending or your resident and go in together to go see, or if their oxygen level is low. The other is like an agitated patient. Um, we definitely care about you guys and want you to be safe. So if the patient's really agitated or combative, um, that is not the time for you to go fight for that history, right? It's okay to step back, um, grab some help because safety is really key. And then the other patients I think about are the ones that are really somnolent or really hard to wake up. Um, those patients, you really want to go and grab some help because those patients may actually be um, sicker than we think. So it's better to have um, your team kind of do meet you at the bedside to really help take care of that patient. Um, which ones do you think about, um, Dr. Rendon, that you would get the seniors involved for? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with, with uh, the ones you mentioned. One that I might add um, is the diaphoretic patient. Mm -hmm. If you ever walk into a room and a patient's sweating, um, then that should um, maybe cue you into a potentially sick patient. So I would keep that, that in mind, the diaphoretic patient. But yeah, yeah those, are, those are very good points, Dr. Nation. Awesome. Yeah, I agree. Because I think we talked about this before. When our patients are sweating, we should be sweating, right? So that's definitely a time to, to grab someone to, to help you out. Um, next slide, please. You know, uh, another thing that's kind of important for our students, especially the sub eyes that are going on rotations to think about is, you know, what are the expectations for ordering? Um, do you have any um, suggestions or guidance for them about, you know, when they should put in orders or how they should approach this? Yeah, this really is going to vary depending on the institution. In some institutions, uh, the medical students or the sub interns might be expected to place orders in the electronic medical record or maybe even on paper if that's what they're using at, at uh, that institution. And they'll be uh, co-signed by a resident or an attending. Or as in, in, other, uh, in other institutions, the students uh, might just tell the resident or verbalize to the attending what they intend to order. But what I would say is what's more to, in my opinion, what is more important than what they're ordering is why they're ordering something. And that's what I really want the, the, the students, excuse me, to, to let me know. Um, 
oftentimes when a student will come and tell me, hey, Dr. Rendon, I want to order this, this, and this, my response will actually be a question. Uh, my, my response will be like, what are you going to do with this result? Or um, uh, how will the, the result of this, of this test change your outcome? Um, and when it comes to medications, whenever I have a student or a sub-intern uh, let me know what medications they want to order, I want to know what doses that they're uh, intending and also any indications and contraindications. One example that immediately comes to mind um, are antiemetics and knowing if the patient uh, perhaps ha has a prolonged QT interval. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I think um, it's kind of easy to memorize the you know, shotgun approach of labs that you would do for each chief complaint, but really understanding why you're ordering it and how it's helping you to get to the, the actual diagnosis is, is really key. So um, your teams will really appreciate if you can um, really share that with them as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like, so if a, if a student suggests, oh, hey, I want to order this, 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 and this, what I don't want to hear is, oh, that's just the way I've seen it done, or that's the way we do it here. I want them to have a reason for, for their uh, for their orders. Okay, awesome. Um, next slide, please. You know, the other thing is that, you know, we're talking about the high acuity and the kind of fast workflow that we see in the ED. Um, but the really important thing is we need to make our patients realize that we are aiming for high quality, exceptional patient-centered care. Um, so Dr. Renan, what are some ways that our students can really help us to make our patients feel unique and special? Yeah, one thing, you know, that I would say, and this may, again, may seem like a very simple fundamental concept, but it's calling the patient by their name. Now, I say that because like on, a, on any given shift, I might see three, four, five patients with the same chief complaint. I might see several patients presenting with chest pain on a shift. But what I don't want to hear are students, and I hear this, you know, from residents and sometimes from, from you know, other, some of my colleagues say, oh, hey, I, can you go check in on the chest pain in room one? Or, hey, can you go follow up on that lady in room 11? And I don't want to label patients by their chief complaint or by what room they're in. You know, call them, call them by their names. You know, go, go check in on Mr. Jones. Go check in on Mrs. Johnson. You know, that's just very special. And addressing the patient when you walk into the room by their name really does help you establish rapport with the patient. And something else that I might add is I, I like to remind students that really every, every patient encounter um, regardless how seemingly mundane it might be, really is an educational opportunity. And if it's something that's even somewhat straightforward and simple, it's still an opportunity to work on some of those intangibles, like um, taking a focus history, establishing rapport, working on your bedside manner. So there's, you know, you can really glean a lot of, of pearls um, from, from really every patient that you can take care of in the emergency department. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I think um, it brings the humanism back to our patients. And um, although their pathologies are very interesting, it really keeps us grounded in why we're um, showing up to work and, and serving our patients. Um, and a couple of kind of key practical ways that our students can really help out would be, you know, if the patient's really cold, as most of us are in the ED, um, they can go and grab a blanket for the patient or make sure that their pa the patient's pain is addressed or the nausea is getting better with the medications. Um, or if the patient is not, you know, NPO and can actually take something by mouth, um, you can be your patient's hero by getting them a glass of water or food. Um, although I would caution our students to first check with the team uh, before doing that, because our, our patients, typically the ones who are not allowed to eat are the ones who are the most hungriest. So uh, definitely be careful before you bring them that sandwich to eat. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Good points. Yeah, so we talked about some ways that, we, that students can send out or excel, but let's change gears really quickly and talk about what some students sh maybe shouldn't be doing in the emergency department. Yeah, I think this is an important thing to, to at least just pause and talk about. Um, you know, behavior is key and etiquette, which I think is goes without saying, but being professional and respectful, just being kind, um, both in the ED, but also in life can really help serve um, all of us really well. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, for our students, just be aware that you're always being watched when you walk into the to the ED, you know, whether it's by the, the nurses or the staff, but especially by your team. So even if you're looking up for example, the heart score on MD Calc. Um, unless if you let your team know what you're doing, they may think you're just texting away the shift, right? So really um, make it known that you're looking up an educational video or um, what you're doing on your cell phone, just so that they know you're being professional and using it in a professional way. And you know, the last kind of advice I would probably say what not to do is, you know, um, definitely think about your team and what they need and how you can serve them. I think that can really help you to 
um, really give that patient-centered care that we look for. Um, Dr. Vanden, do you have some other thoughts? No, those were all very good, uh, good pearls there. Um, I would say one thing not to do is don't say that you did something if you actually didn't do it. Um, you know, some, for example, if you have a patient who comes in and they're fatigued and they're um, anemic, don't tell your resident or your attending that you performed a rectal examination when you actually didn't. Or don't say, oh yeah, uh, the patient told me that their tetanus shot was up to date when you, you, when you actually didn't ask them that question. So just to be forthcoming uh, and, and to be honest with, with, your, with your team. And that also applies to procedures. So if your resident asks you like, hey, do you wanna do this lumbar puncture? Don't say, oh yeah, sure, I've done a couple before when you know, maybe all you did was watch a YouTube video once and you've never done one before. So being, being very earnest about your, your uh, procedural experience is also very important. And I've, and got my, lots of, I've got lots of stories that I could <laughs> go on about that topic. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we all do actually as attendings, but I think, yeah, you're, you're definitely very true. You know, honesty can go a long way and really help to open that um, bridge to really um, help us to fill in those gaps of the uh, medical knowledge that, you, that our students may not have. Um, so definitely um, it's okay to say that you didn't do it or you don't, didn't even know that was a question to ask because now we're helping you learn. So I think that's really important for our students to know. Um, next slide, please. You know, another pitfall that um, is pretty common is that the chief complaint listed in the triage note may not actually match what the patient is coming in with. So we kind of have this face off between the two workups that could potentially be done. Um, Dr. Renan, do you have a good way to kind of figure out what the, the real chief complaint is? Yeah, great, great question. You know, if the patient is seems stable, like if their vital signs are normal, or if maybe even a late eye on them um, and, and they appear well. I like to read the, the triage note before I, I go in just to have an idea of what they told the nursing staff. But despite that, I still go in and this all goes back to, to what we talked about earlier is I like to start my, my uh, history taking with just an open-ended question. You know, you know, Mr. or Mrs., you know, what, what brings you in today? What, how can we help you today? And sometimes there actually might be discrepancies between what's written in the triage note and what the patient might tell you. So um, I would say start off with open-ended questions and, and let the patient kind of tell you what's going on. And a lot of us have probably heard this statistic uh, before, but, you know, the average physician will interrupt their patient, you know, in the first 17 or 18 seconds of them providing you with the history. So, um, I try to encourage my students and, and my interns, you know, to, to allow the patient to talk and, you know, they'll, they'll be able to tell you uh, what's going on. Yeah, no, I think that's a great kind of foundation of where to start the, the interview is just uh, let the patient talk in and share their, their experience about themselves. Great. Next slide, please. You know, another pitfall that we often see is this kind of anatomical overlap. So unfortunately, our, over, our organ systems are not like kind of boxed up in those two different areas. You know, our thoracic cavity, unfortunately, overlaps with our abdominal cavity. And so you can really have these kind of strange diagnoses that can come out of it. For example, a patient with nausea or epigastric pain could actually be acute coronary syndrome. Or I know we've both have had patients who have pleuritic right upper quadrant pain, and it actually ends up being a PE or you know right lower lobe pneumonia instead of that gallbladder pathology that we're really thinking. Uh, so just remember that you know not, not all of our patients that show up will follow that textbook. So starting out with that broad differential diagnosis as you're walking into the room can really help you out. And then you can narrow it down based on your history and physical exam. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say that the same applies to the pediatric population as well. So if I have a pediatric patient or an adolescent uh, male patient presenting with lower abdominal pain, I want to hear about the GU exam as well, because of course, uh, you know, torsion would be on the differential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, no, that's very, very important. It's definitely be very thorough and think about those overlaps. Next slide, please. Yeah, and similarly, another pitfall is uh, anchoring bias and premature closure. Anchoring bias is, as you kind of already alluded to, is, is uh, going into the patient's room without that broad differential. That is, you've kind of already made up your mind before you even go into the room. So if, for example, you have um, a 65-year-old gentleman with a chief complaint of flank pain and hematuria, uh, anchoring would be going in there already saying, saying to yourself, oh, this patient has a kidney stone. Let me go, let me go evaluate them. Or as we know that we should avoid this premature closure and have a broad differential, including 
high risk life threats, you know, such as a AAA or a bleeding malignancy or a renal vein thrombosis. There could be other entities that we need to be considering here. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And I think uh, the key is to give yourself permission that if the story doesn't fit with the workup that's being done, um, whether it's a sign out patient or a patient that you're seeing primarily, if the, if the story doesn't fit, it's okay to start over and do a reassessment, because uh, that reassessment is really key to getting down to, you know, what's happening with the patient. Next slide, please. So why don't we kind of close with just a few tips on how our students can really learn on shift, because I think, you know, depending on where you're rotating and so on, um, you know, it'll be really uh, variable on the experience that you'll get. And we, we hope that you'll have a wonderful experience no matter where you go, but really being proactive in your education is key. And so we wanted to share just a few learning on shift um, pearls for you. Dr. Renan, what are your top ones? Yeah, um, I would suggest to our students, um, I would say this is not the time to be shy. Um, you know, you'll have different um, different attendings, different residents with different levels of experience, different levels of educational experience, and some of them might orient you um, as soon as you walk into the emergency department and set goals, set expectations for for your shift. Um, and that might not always be the case. Sometimes you might just come in and hit the ground running. So in those situations, it's really important for you to set your own goals, set your own objectives. And it can be something somewhat simple, like, hey, I wanna work on um, taking a history today. I wanna work on my uh, problem-based uh, focused physical examination today. Or it could be something a little bit more measurable. Uh, for example, um, you can set a goal for yourself. Like I want to take a problem-based focus physical uh, and perform a history uh, in less than 10 minutes or in less than 12 minutes and set, set some goals for, for your shift. Um, uh, another uh, pearl that I would suggest is also to kind of keep a running list, a second brain, if you will, of things that you have learned, tidbits, questions that you have. Uh, interesting cases that you can go home and read about after after your shift. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And one of my favorite tips would be, you know, don't be afraid to ask for feedback, especially, you know, our students, you, you're getting an evaluation at the very end of it. So sometimes it might take you off guard, you know, what's actually being written. So I think it's okay to pause and ask your team, you know, for feedback, either real time or after the shift, uh, just wait for the opportune moments, right? So probably while they're taking care of a hypotensive patient or a coding patient, that's not the ideal time. But once you have that lull in the shift, it's okay to pull them aside and ask them, you know, what are opportunities that you can get better and improve on? So you can actually incorporate that real time and, and show them that you're willing to learn and willing to improve as well. And then also just getting incorporated in the team. So helping up with following up on labs or images offering the call those consults that I was talking about or grabbing those procedural tools, all of those can really help you be a valuable part of the team. Next slide, please. So we're actually gonna be walking through some of the um, bread and butter cases um, for PBLs. And my wonderful colleagues will be walking you through some of the main chief complaints and giving you a systematic way to approach these. And feel, feel free to ask questions in the chat bar and we'll try to answer those real time. And we'll have time at the very end as well too to take your questions. Hi, I'm Ava Pierce, and I'm an associate professor at UT Southwestern Medical Center and the associate chair for diversity and inclusion in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Hey there, I'm Leslie Willenters Foster. I work for MedStar Emergency Physicians in the DC area, which is affiliated with um, Georgetown's residency program. I am the co-lead for the orphan applicant group from CORD's uh, advising students in emergency medicine group. So we wanna walk you through a case of chest pain. Our patient is a 71 year old female who presents with chest pain and shortness of breath. Her past medical history includes hypertension, congestive heart failure, COPD, breast cancer, coronary artery disease, diabetes, and elevated cholesterol. And she's a cigarette smoker. Next slide, please. Her vitals are blood pressure 180 over 90, heart rate of 101, her respiratory rate's 24, her temperature is 99, her oxygen saturation is 94% on room air. She's diaphoretic when you walk into the room. So as we just heard earlier, clearly this is a patient that you should be concerned about. She has pallor and bilateral lower extremity edema. Next slide. So, 
are some important workup things that you would want to know and do for this patient? Um, a couple of things you would definitely want to get right off the bat would be a STAT EKG, and you would want to look for any ST elevation or any signs of severe ischemia in this patient. Another thing that you can do to quickly sort of drill down to what's going on with the patient is you can use point of care ultrasound, which can be super helpful, um, especially if you're taking a look at an echo, looking at the heart, looking at the lungs. Those are some important things for a patient with chest pain. Obviously, you always want to get that chest x-ray, make sure you're not missing anything glaring. Um, and some other things that you might want to grab are some basic labs. You might want to grab a complete um, blood count. And reason being, you want to take a look at their hemoglobin, see if they have any anemia, what their uh, immunostatus might be with their white blood cell count. Always want to look at some electrolytes and obviously troponin, take a look at that heart, a pro BNP in terms of looking for any fluid overload and a D-dimer, which we can discuss in more detail coming up. So what are some of the things that you would be thinking about as diagnosis and the differential diagnosis for this patient? Could this be ACS? Could this be an aortic dissection? Cardiac tamponade, esophageal rupture? Next slide. So you wanna make sure when you're getting the history, you get those key historical um, information from the patient. You know, what's the location of the pain? What's the severity and intensity? Is there any radiation in the pain? Are there any associated shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis? And then you work through getting your STAT EKG. And what treatment will we do when we find the diagnosis? So if this is ACS, we wanna consider nitroglycerin, unless this is an inferior or right ventricular infarct, in which point you wouldn't wanna give nitroglycerin because of hypotension, aspirin, heparin, dual antiplatelet therapy, and then thinking about definitive management, PCI with standing or cabbage. If this were an aortic dissection, you wanna think about what's your emergent treatments in the emergency department, pain control, blood pressure control with considering labetalol and esmolol drip, and in your definitive management, surgery for a type A versus medical management for a type B aortic dissection. So what if this patient had cardiac tamponade? Again, your ABCs initially, IV fluids, consider pericardiocentesis in the emergency department, and definitive management being the cath lab for drain placement versus a pericardial window. If our patient was having significant amounts of vomiting and you diagnose esophageal rupture, again, your ABCs would broad spectrum antibiotics in the emergency department with definitive care, including surgical intervention and ICU care. And in our patient that we're seeing currently with uh, chest pain, if she had ACS, you always wanna think about the heart score. We won't go through all the different portions of the heart score, but we want you to think about calculating that on your patients with ACS to help you make decisions on admission and disposition. This is the EKG for our patient. So she's having a ST elevation MI in Fearly. I would want you to consider doing right-sided leads to see if she's having a right ventricular infarct and immediately get this patient off to the cath lab. So we're gonna try and reimagine this case. Uh, let's say this patient is still 71, she still has some chest pain and shortness of breath, but on this physical exam, let's say her lungs are clear. She does look a little tachypnic when you walk into the room and her pulse ox is 91 when she's breathing on room air. Other pertinent positives on the exam are she's got some right lower extremity edema and erythema. And this is only on, on one side, as I had said. So when we're talking about workups, uh, like we had mentioned, there's definitely some overlap. Um, obviously, you always want to get that stat EKG. Definitely want to grab chest x-ray. And this can also be a great time to pull out the ultrasound, take a look at the lungs and the heart. And what about that D-dimer? So the patient has clear lungs, and she's not satting as well as you would want. So when we're talking about pre-test probability, when we're thinking, do we think this lady really might have a pulmonary embolism? Somebody's pre-test probability is their likelihood of having an illness. So that's based on the prevalence of the disease in the population. That's like if you sent a urine test for pregnancy on patients, female patients who are in their 90s versus in their 30s, you would think it's way less likely in the patients in their 90s. So what we're going to talk about that in terms of the well score and the PER criteria. These are two things that you might have heard a lot about or you might have already used when you're in the department. So here's a big chart when this is available on CDEMS curriculum, which I would totally encourage everybody to take a look at, not just for our presentation, but also for all chief complaint based problems. Um, 
basically we're trying to decide, is this likely? Is this something that is probably definitely not gonna happen? Can we put these patients into buckets essentially? So is it on the lower end of the spectrum where you can confidently say that we'll use the per criteria or is it possible? And in that, that would be a Wells criteria between two and four. And is this pretty likely that we would really consider RD just jumping into imaging and maybe treatment? And that's if their criteria is higher than four. So what are these criteria? Obviously this is a lot of words on a slide, but basically we're trying to use the Wells criteria to place those patients into buckets. And some things that you look at, have they had a prior um, DVT? Have they had a prior PE? Does this patient have signs of DVT? Do we even think it's likely? So that one's a little bit more tricky because that one you sort of have to develop your gestalt in terms of do I think it's the most likely? Have they had surgery recently? Are they coughing up blood? Are they actively getting cancer treatment? So when you use that side of the equation, basically, in order to put patients into these categories, we'll say, huh, okay, does this patient have less than two? That means that we can sort of move into that PERC rule, which is those yes or no criteria where we decide if we need to do any imaging or any, I'm sorry, any lab work. So if that's negative also, we're good. It's very, very unlikely that the patient has a PE. And however, if we test positive on the PERC rule, then that means we move to the D-dimer. So the D-dimer is a test that we send, blood work basically, which will indicate how likely it is that the patient has a PE or DBT. If that test is negative, great, the patient's looking good. We don't think it's very likely that they have pulmonary embolus. However, if that's positive, then we would order some imaging. So um, I would encourage you guys to take a look at which imaging is the best. If someone scores high on this criteria, you would wanna also consider empiric treatment. So moving back to our patient, she's awarded three points for having signs and symptoms of a DVT. If you remember her right lower extremity was edematous and had some erythema attached to it. I would also say that PE is definitely as likely in this patient. The other thing that the patient has going for her is that she's being treated with tamoxifen for her cancer therapy and she gets another point for that. So we are going to go to the high section and we would just go ahead and order imaging. And also we would order some anticoagulation. So what would we use for this patient? We would definitely use some unfractionated heparin or we could use low molecular weight heparin. And a lot of times that these patients get admitted. However, sometimes if you wanna look like a rock star on your rotations, especially, I would take a look at these two criteria, the s pezzi score and the Hestia score. That's where we start a patient on a direct oral anticoagulant like Xarelto or Eliquis and those two things, those types of medications the patients can possibly safely go home with. Let's change it up again. Let's say that the patient's really not doing so great. She's speaking in two to three word sentences. Her respiratory rate's in the 30s. She's satting 85%. She also has a history of COPD and CHF and we hear some wheezes. And what are some things that we would wanna do for this patient? And as soon as you walk into the room, um, and this is what my two colleagues were talking about earlier at the top, is this something that you wanna get a senior involved in? Is this patient sicker than you feel like you are able to handle on your own? That being said, if we feel like we need to address the patient's respiratory distress, non-invasive positive pressure, AKA BPAP, is something that you would definitely wanna consider in this patient where you might be able to sort of stave off an intubation, help that patient turn the corner for you. So some indications for that are obviously moderate to severe dyspnea. If they're working really hard to breathe, they're using accessory muscles, if they're looking kind of tired, or if later down the line, if you get some lab work back and they're acidotic or their PCO2 is above 45. When do you not want to use BFAP? Anybody who is you know, altered and not able to wear the mask, if somebody's vomiting into the mask um, or if their anatomy doesn't fit it and they're just kind of not tolerating it or if they're looking really sick and they're looking like they're about to arrest, um, those are some reasons why you would not want to consider non-invasive positive pressure. So work up for this new patient, same things, EKG, chest x-ray, point of care ultrasound, and lab work. Some things that you would want to take a look at to sort of help differentiate this patient because she has COPD and she also has a history of CHF. Those two things can very definitely have an overlapping presentation. And I think the thing that's probably going to help you out the most here 
is your point of care ultrasound. If you see some bee lines on ultrasound, those are, that's a pretty clear indication that this patient might have flash pulmonary edema, and especially if they have a history of CHF. Wheezing, you can have cardiac wheezing or respiratory wheezing. And obviously you can have sudden or gradual onset of um, COPD. Usually flash pulmonary edema is pretty quick. So positive pressure, again, it's gonna be your friend. We're gonna help kind of push all that fluid out of the patient's lungs and using nitroglycerin is also a really good move because that is a rapid onset medication. Um, the medication that you use also is a systemic venous and arterial dilator, which is key. And you can decrease their MAP and reduce their preload and their afterload when you use it in high doses. If your patient's not responding to nitroglycerin, you can give nitroprusside a try. And you're gonna wanna titrate both of these things to the patient's symptoms as well as their baseline um, blood pressure. So, we have a couple of pearls for you here. Always wanna get that stat EKG that you really need to, obviously there's a lot of, patients do much better once you get them to intervention like a PCI and usually the metric is within 90 minutes. Point of care ultrasound is your friend here. Definitely wanna consider non-invasive positive pressure. And when you're trying to evaluate a patient for whether or not they need workup or imaging, um, and how likelihood, how, what their likelihood is for having pulmonary embolus. You always want to use the Wells criteria before the perk rule. And vitals are vital. Remember that. Awesome. Thank you so much. We're excited to take it over from here and talk a little bit about abdominal pain and uh, give you a systematic approach to, to this. I'm Dr. Serena Dacian and my wonderful colleague, Ashlea Winfield from Cook County will kind of be walking you through abdominal pain. Next slide, please. So kind of as we uh, as we jump into this, you can imagine how vast uh, the topic of abdominal pain is, right? In 10 minutes, we're supposed to cover all of abdominal pain. That's a little bit, um, a little, we're very zealous, but that's a little bit overzealous for us. So we really wanted to give you that platform to build upon. Next slide, please. As we sort of progress through this case, our format's gonna be a little different than before, but as we talk through the case, I'm gonna be playing the role of you guys, a learner, um, and Dr. Nadation's gonna be the attending. Um, but what I want you to do is challenge yourself. So as I'm asking questions um, of the patient, think about what you would be asking. Um, as I'm doing exam maneuvers, think about things that you would be looking for. Try to be very intentional about sort of your physical exam in terms of history and questioning. Everything should be answering a question or targeting or basically narrowing your diagnosis differential. And this is a great way for you guys to kind of practice in real time as we walk through through the case itself. And just remember male and female pathology, right? While there are a lot of similarities, there are a lot of differences as well too. So it's really important, especially with the abdominal pain to really think about the differences between male and female pathology, just so that you're not missing anything um, that could potentially be on your differential diagnosis. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna be the instructor here. So. Um, so you have a patient that's presenting today, a 24-year-old female who's coming in with nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. And here are her vitals, and I'm also giving you her primary survey. All right. So again, I'm the learner. I'm taking note. So if I'm looking at the board, I see 24-year-old female, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, not dizziness, so I'm ready. Um, blood pressure looks okay, heart rate's fine. She's afebrile, SATs are okay. And from looking at the primary survey, she looks a little uncomfortable, um, but is probably pretty stable. Um, so I'm good there. So um, I guess, can I ask some questions of the patient now? Yeah, your patient's right here and she's able to answer questions for you. Okay. Um, so uh, my first question is, when did you start having symptoms, namely the abdominal pain? She said, you know, doctor, my, my pain started about three days ago or so, but it's really gotten worse over the last couple hours. And it's really kind of hard to move now because of how, how, how bad that pain is. Okay. So it started the last couple of days. It's worsening. Um, and it's particularly worse sort of when you move around. Um, mm -hmm. Is it in any particular location, upper belly, lower belly, left, right? Yeah, it feels like it's kind of down on that right side. Before it was all over, but now it's really just down on that right side. Okay, and how would you describe it? Sharp, crampy? Yeah, it's like a dull kind of pain, a dull but severe. And does it come and go or is it just sort of always? Yeah, it's been constant now. Okay, 
And do you have any other symptoms with it? I saw that there was some nausea and vomiting. Mm -hmm. um, anything yeah, that, else? that really kind of started today, the nausea, and I haven't really been eating a whole lot. I feel like I'm going to throw up, but nothing's really coming up at all. Okay. Um, and have you had any fevers at home or chills? You know, I, I felt really hot, but I don't really have a thermometer to check. Okay. And is there anything that you tried that maybe made it better? Um, I tried some Tylenol and then some Motrin as well, but neither of those did anything. Okay. And I know you said moving around made it worse. Was there anything mm -hmm. else that you noticed maybe when you urinate or when you mm -hmm. eat? No, neither of those. Um, the, you know, I didn't really eat at all, but you know, when I pee, it's normal. And when I have a, you know, when I poop, it's normal as well too. Um, and just, I have to ask you a set of sort of more sensitive questions. Um, just because sort of down in the lower abdomen, it can affect stuff in the belly, but then also sort of within the pelvis. So um, just a few questions. Have you, um, when was your last menstrual cycle? It was about two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Okay. And any unusual vaginal discharge or bleeding that's atypical for you? No, everything's been normal. And you said urination was normal as well. No mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and any past medical history? No, I've been otherwise healthy. I've never actually been to the ER even. Any surgeries before? Probably not if you've never been to the ER, right? Yeah, nope, nope. No smoking, drinking drugs? Uh, no, I try to stay away from that. Okay, um, I think I have enough of a history. Um, I'd like to proceed with my physical exam. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so again, I'm gonna lie the patient flat. Um, I'm going to expose her abdomen. Um, when I look at the belly, do I see any abnormal findings on the skin or? Uh, you see no distension um, and no no skin findings. All right. I know she's most tender in the right lower quadrant, so I'm kind of going to save that. Um, anything in the left upper belly? Um, there's nothing. She's soft up there. Okay. Uh, mid epigastric or right upper quadrant? Um, no tenderness there either. Okay. If I push in the left lower quadrant, do I notice any pain there? Um, no, not there, but she does say it hurts a lot more on the right side. Okay. So like a positive rising sign? Okay. Um, I'm also going to... Um, just now intentionally palpate the right lower quadrant, any tenderness there? And she does have uh, quite a bit of tenderness down there. Okay. Um, I'm going to now lay the patient on her left lateral decubitus in, in that position, and I'm going to extend sort of the right leg. Um, am I getting any changes in terms of her pain? Is she reporting anything there? Um, yes, it is positive. Okay. And then um, I'm also going to have her in the supine position, I'm going to sort of um, passively flex the right knee and then perform internal rotation sort of at the hip. Do I notice any discomfort there? And she said that does cause quite a bit of pain. Okay, so I have positive psoas in addition to operator along with, I mean, I'm getting all of it. I've got all the things. Um, and kind of like I explained to the patient before, sometimes um, because of that anatomic overlap, there could be also a problem in the pelvis. So um, I just would like to proceed with the pelvic exam as well to make sure I'm not missing signs of PID or something else. Yeah, and when you do that, you see a completely normal uh, pelvic exam with no no signs of any discharge. Okay, so I think at this point, I would like to order some labs. Okay. Hey, why don't we, next slide please, why don't we pause real quick and uh, talk about your differential. You know, a lot of times we see our students kind of jump into the workup without actually letting us take a peek into their minds of what's happening. So what are some of your differentials with the information you have so far? Well, obviously, I have every positive sign for appendicitis you can think of. So, Appy is my primary. Um, also, she is a woman of childbearing age. I don't have a upreg back, so she could easily just as well have an ectopic with free fluid in the belly. Um, and again, thinking of the pelvis, it could be torsion. She's kind of had like this course that kind of just kind of progressively got worse. And then I kind of mentioned PID. Um, nephrolithiasis, inflammatory bowel issues. Those are sort of my differentials, but again, Appy is my primary. And then I'm really worried about making sure she doesn't have an ectopic because um, I don't have a HCG back yet. Okay, perfect, okay, next slide, please. So let's talk about your workup. What would you like to do next? Um, so obviously I just said it like eight times that I would like a urine <laughs> pregnancy test. Um, and then just basic screening labs if I'm looking for an Appy versus other process. So CBC and BMP. Um, I'm not really getting any tenderness in the upper belly. It's not really postprandial. I'm not really thinking it's biliary or pancreatitis. So I'm not too keen on the CMP um, with the full LFTs in my face. So I'll just start with the basics. Um, and then again, um, she doesn't have any urinary symptoms. I'm not going to treat her. 
Um, but so we can think about a urine. Um, and then if she does have a surgical belly, I could just ask the nurse to draw and hold type and screen coags. And then if I have to give antibiotics, we'll hold cultures too. Um, and then I guess for a definitive diagnosis, cause the labs won't get me there. If I'm really suspecting an appy, I think she was 80 kilos. Correct. Yep. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so ultrasound's not going to help in a 24 year old, um, with sort of that um, habit is. So I would proceed with the CT abdomen pelvis with contrast to rule out appendicitis. Okay, perfect. Next slide, please. And what do you think about her symptoms? She's complaining of a quite a bit of pain and nausea as well too. Fill my boards because I haven't treated her symptoms. So um, I would like to, she says she's been having some nausea, maybe not eating as much. So I'd like to give her um, a liter of normal saline bolus. She has no contraindications to giving fluids wide open. Um, she does have the nausea, so I'll give her some Ondansetron for um, pain control. I want her NPO in case she does have a surgical issue. So I'll just do um, four of morphine um, and we'll make her NPO pending her results. I don't want okay. her yelling at me. So. Okay, awesome. No, that's great. Next slide, please. So your patient is HCG negative, so she's not pregnant. And we'll say that your CT actually now shows appendicitis. So what are your next steps now knowing this diagnosis? Um, well, now that I know that, I know that I can't fix it and we need source control. So I'm going to talk to the general surgeon, um, depending on our antibiogram versus what our surgeon prefers, I'll also give her antibiotics. Um, and then those preoperative labs I talked about the, that we pre-drew the coags, the type and screen. Um, and because my institution likes cultures for all, um, prior to all administration of antibiotics, I'll also uh, do blood cultures as well. Yeah. I think you did a, you know, quite a few things that were really important during the run through of this case. You know, one is always consider, you know, is she pregnant or not pregnant? Because that's important. And then also remember if we could have made this patient easily at 24 years old, but maybe in second or third trimester, right? So just remember that in pregnancy, the anatomical location can actually change. So maybe the patient who's pregnant with appendicitis might have right upper quadrant pain or right mid abdominal pain or even back pain. And so it's good to kind of think about that. And then you also mentioned, um, you know, ultrasound is really good for pediatrics or those kind of very thin or smaller uh, body habits. Um, you can actually start with ultrasound first. But in most cases, uh, with a normal build um, patient, uh, you should be thinking about CT with or without contrast um, for that. And then uh, just for our med students, just a quick uh, resource if you're looking for something. Um, JAMA has a uh, clinical examination series that has a, um, a lot of great um, articles that talk about, you know, based on our history and physical exam, where should you put your money at, right? Which ones are the most, uh, you know, sure that'll help you get the highest likelihood ratio towards that diagnosis. So definitely check those out if you're looking for, for a good reading. Next slide, please. Um, so this is sort of some of our tips for examination. So just whenever you're going in, they say their belly hurts, maybe they just point to the right upper, you kind of palpate there and kind of poke around, but just be more systematic. When you're pushing somewhere, I'm specifically looking for tenderness at McBurney's or I'm looking for a Murphy sign. So always just sort of be intentional. They kind of said this before, vitals are vital. So if you're approaching a patient with severe abdominal pain, it's one thing to have a hypotensive elderly gentleman complaining of abdominal pain and somebody with normal pressure who's maybe a little tacky. So just kind of remember to have your vitals as you approach your initial assessment because it changes how much time you have to ask a ton of questions um, and if you want to do any immediate interventions. Um, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but just remember... Um, and I won't go over it too much because it came up in the first lecture, but there are some differences in male and female pathology. Um, also consider sort of the pelvis or some of these lower abdominal complaint, complaint uh, mama, abdominal pain complaints. Um, and then remember uh, HCG for all patients of childbearing age. And again, I kind of talked about the pelvis already, so we'll leave the pelvis mm -hmm. for the rest. Of the awesome. Okay. And next slide, please. And kind of really when you're entering the room to see these patients with abdominal pain, um, really think about the location of the pain because that can really help you to figure out what your differential diagnosis should be and also what questions you should be asking. And that'll really help you to present that in a very concise and efficient way to your team and really get closer towards that uh, definitive diagnosis. And the other thing is undress your patients. Uh, you'd be surprised how many times a patient will point kind of to one side of their belly. You can't tell if it's the upper quadrant or lower quadrant. You also can't 
tell if there's like a, a you know a stripe of shingles underneath their gown as well, right? That's causing their pain. Um, so really um, lift up the gown, have the patient point, and really take a look at what quadrant is that um, abdominal pain is, and that can really help you to really um, kind of hone in on your differential diagnosis and and really help your team out in getting close to serving that patient and and making them feel better. Okay, next slide. All right, hi, I'm Tiffany Mitchell. I'm an attending at Mount Sinai and I'm Chair of Social Media and Publications for ADIM. And I'm going to be talking to you guys about dizziness and vertigo. Next slide, okay. So dizziness is one of those, um, it's, it's one of the most common chief complaints you're going to see in the ED. As a med student, I love dizziness because I knew like, you know, it could literally be anything. As an attending, dizziness drives me crazy because it can literally be anything. And you're going to have a lot of patients coming in with dizziness and you're going to have to really pull it out of them to figure out, okay, what system are we going to focus on? And so that's why I have this little word cloud here because it really can be anything. <laughs> so about like 30% of the time, it'll be otologic or vestibular. So affecting something that's impacting like the, the cranial nerve eight. About 20% of the time, it's going to be cardiovascular. Maybe another 20% of the time, it's going to be purely neurologic and you know it could be infectious it could be tox it could be drugs it could be psych so it's one of those things you really kind of have to have a super broad differential and i also like business because it's one of those it's one of those uh chief complaints where you really cannot get out of just doing a super good history and a super thorough physical like you really just have to it guides the entire the entire management and the entire workup that you're going to do. And so it's, it's, this is a, this is an opportunity for you to really star as a med student. If you can go and just do a super thorough history and physical and, and really, you know, shape the course of the, of the patient's course in that way. Next slide. So I'm going to start by talking about a real case that I actually had um, as an intern. So just to highlight, this patient came in, this is a 73 year old woman. She came in complaining of dizziness, but really she was like, she kept saying, I think I just need to eat more. I think, you know, I'm just really dehydrated and I haven't really been eating. I haven't had much of an appetite. And I'm sure this is just, I'm sure this is just the fact that I haven't been eating. So she comes in, she's got a, a past medical history of diabetes and she's also legally blind um, due to some unclear congenital retinopathy. Her vitals are unremarkable, nothing really to write home about. Next slide. So a bit more history. So I'm talking to her and she's really not giving me much to work with. She's saying, yeah, I'm just kind of dizzy, feeling kind of weak. Also, I've been falling a bit, but again, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm just dehydrated and you know, my blood sugar is low. After like, you know, several minutes of really trying to pull it out of her, I finally called her cousin because she hadn't brought herself into the hospital. Her cousin had called 911. Um, talked to her cousin and the cousin says, yeah, I came home and I found her crawling on the floor to get to the bathroom. So that raised me, that, that raised some red flags. That's, that's very odd and the patient didn't mention that. Um, so I talked to the patient, she reluctantly admitted that she'd been having trouble, that she, you know, she'd been urinating on herself and had trouble getting to the toilet but primarily because she couldn't walk the way she used to walk. And she had actually borrowed a walker from a neighbor because her, her, you know, she really couldn't walk the way she used to. And all of this was something I had to really kind of pull out of her. Um, she also mentioned that a doctor told her that she may have needed brain surgery a couple of years back, but she never really followed up and hadn't really seen a doctor since then. So this just goes to highlight, you know, a lot of times your patients are going to do everything in their power to minimize and to throw you off the scent. They, you, they, they, you would think that a patient would tell you, I can't walk, <laughs> or I literally couldn't physically walk to the bathroom. But a lot of times your patients just aren't. The last uh, instim you admitted swore to me that he was just having heartburn. So you really are going to have to tease out what's going on. And, and sometimes it's going to be tricky. And if, and if you're really unsure, get some collateral information. All right, next patient, the uh, next, next next page. All right, so physical exam. I'm just gonna go for like the pertinent positive. So she, you know, looks pretty well. She's sitting up in bed. She's awake, alert, super pleasant. Uh, no evidence of trauma. So I wasn't really worried that, you know, she may have like, you know, hurt herself on one of these falls. 
cardiovascular, her heart rate sounds, her heart sounds normal. No, you know, murmurs or anything that I could appreciate. Breast sounds are clear, belly soft, non-tender, non-distended. Uh, MSK, her, you know, she didn't have any gross weakness or asymmetry on exam. Um, there's no edema, no swollen joints or, or red erythematous joints, anything like that. From a psych standpoint, she seemed a little kind of apathetic. She was really nice, but really didn't seem concerned about her symptoms. Like I, you know, if I couldn't walk, that'd be the first thing I would say. And she just seemed to kind of not be that concerned with, uh, with her symptoms. So the neuro exam, cranial nerves were for the most part intact. No, no, no big cranial nerve findings, no focal cranial nerve findings. Um, her pupils were equal round reacted to light bilaterally. Sensation was intact to soft and sharp touch bilaterally. She had a little bit of weakness in her lower extremities. Upper extremities, uh, strength was normal. Um, she was only oriented to self. And this was something, again, it took a lot of pulling. So you would think, so again, back to the initial point of don't say you did something if you didn't do it. So I had to ask her, what year is it? And she took a, a while to tell me. And finally, she was like, I believe it's 1997 or 1977. And I'm looking at her and I said, no, 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 the year that, that we're in right now. And she slowly was, she goes, yeah, I think it's 1977. Very strange. I asked her what hospital or where we were and she named the different hospital. And again, something that you really never would have picked up if you hadn't directly asked. And I had to directly ask her, what year is it? Where are we? She was only oriented to self. And her gait exam, she politely declined, refused to stand up and walk for me. Next page. So long story short, we get a CT. <laughs> Just to start it off, uh, the labs are unremarkable. We got the CT and it showed an epidermoid cyst in the posterior fossa with mass effect on the fourth ventricle, resulting in an obstructive hydrocephalus. So she had really big ventricles and uh, this was what was kind of going on. Next. Uh, so she was eventually transferred to our, um, to our other hospital and, and referred to neurosurgery where she likely had a VP shunt placed or um, plus or minus uh, mass resection. So wet, wackly, wobbly, she had all of the findings of typically associated with normal pressure hydrocephalus, but uh, hers was a obstructive hydrocephalus and probably had, had progressed, had developed over quite some time, which is why her symptoms were kind of gradual and, and not really acute. She wasn't complaining of headaches. It was very kind of a gradual presentation. Um, so the wet, wacky, wobbly, urinary incontinence, wet, check she had that cognitive disturbance yep very strange she she was basically it was dementia it was it was, it was you know some degree of dementia and gait difficulty she couldn't walk was having a, a, a great deal of difficulty walking um and so this you know these symptoms arise due to the dysfunction of the motor areas of the frontal lobe and periventricular white matter tracts due to the uh due to the distension of the ventricles resulting in that um those those findings so next page. So the tricky part about dizziness is that the first step is figuring out, is this really dizziness? And when we mean dizziness, we're talking about specifically vertigo. So vertigo is, true vertigo, is disorientation in space combined with a sense of motion. It can, it can be subjective or it can be objective. So it's either a hallucination of movement of self or of the environment. So feeling unsteady, feeling like you're moving in relation to your environment or feeling like the room is spinning around you. And it's something you really, again, it's just with history and it can be extremely difficult. And don't even get me started if you're talking to someone, you know, through a translator, it's, it's, it's really, really hard to tease out what people mean when they say, I feel dizzy. And so the main things you really have to distinguish it from is, is it lightheadedness where you feeling like you're about to pass out is it pre-syncope? Is it pink syncope? Did you actually pass out? And you really kind of have to tease that out because people are going to, you know, a lot of your patients are going to say dizziness when, you know, they don't know how to describe. Not all of your patients are going to have the language to describe exactly what they're feeling. Another really interesting case that I had, I had a patient who'd been seen in the ED twice and she kept complaining of sinus pressure. She said, my sinuses are really acting up. They're driving me crazy. My sinuses, my sinuses, my sinuses. And my attending was just like, send her home. Like, you know, it's not an emergency. She's got sinusitis, give her some Flonase, you know, whatever. The only abnormal finding she had on the exam was she had a marked 
right sided um uh right uh, hand drop arm drop and she again it wasn't something she complained of she wasn't saying you know i feel a little i have difficulty holding my right arm up because it's not something you generally do and it wasn't weak it was she just had a marked right sided drop and when you really kind of you know, did a thorough neuro exam, you saw there's a little bit of deficit on that side. And she was having, she'd had a stroke, she had an acute stroke. And so this is something that it's really, really, you can't get around the history and you can't get around the physical exam. It's just doing a really thorough physical exam because you're going to miss some of these more subtle findings. Next page. The second step. So after you've, dis you've d effectively determined that this is in fact a vertigo, your second step is going to figure out, okay, is this peripheral or central? And so when we're talking about peripheral, we're talking about any kind of lesion or something that's impacting cranial nerve eight. So that's, this can be, or the vestibular system in the inner ear. So this could be BPPV, which is fairly common where you have little otolins in the vestibular system that get dislodged. Again, try explaining that to a patient through a translator. You sound like a crazy person, but very common and can, you know, drive your patients crazy. Meniere's disease, um, you know, acute labyrinthitis, vestibulopathy, vestibular neuritis. So it, you can have these post-viral syndromes kind of causing it. Again, you, you always want Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. You want to look for any rash, you know, like a herpes zoster type picture that could be impacting cranial nerve eight. Um, so there's the peripheral causes, which by virtue of being peripheral are generally going to be, you know, less, less urgent. The ones you really don't want to miss are the central causes, which for the most part, we're thinking about cerebellar strokes, but it can also be MS. It can also be, you know, a vertebral dissection or a vertebral aneurysm, so, um, or a mass, um, or, you know, hydrocephalus. So you also, so you really want to kind of, that's the next step is really kind of teasing apart if this is peripheral or this is central. And there are a number of clinical findings that can kind of help you decide whether or not this is most likely peripheral or most likely likely a central etiology. And that's one thing that when you're presenting this patient, that's what I'm going to ask you. Do you think it's peripheral or do you think it's central? So make sure that you've thought about this and you've gone through your list of clinical findings. Next page. So again, it's history, 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 and also physical. So what was the onset? Was it sudden? Was it gradual? Did it happen over a long period of time? Does it happen over months, years, weeks? Or did it just happen all of a sudden? The timing is gonna be really, really important. First thing I ask when a patient comes in with you know, vertigo is, well, is it constant? Is this happening you know, all the time? Like you can't walk, you can't move, you can't eat, you can't drink, you're constantly feeling it, or is it kind of coming and going? And that'll kind of help you guide which way you're going to go. So constant vertigo really is concerning for a central cause. Paroxysmal intermittent vertigo is most likely going to be a peripheral etiology. Is it aggregated by aggregated by aggravated by movement or position? It can kind of be either either one, but it's going to be mo uh, more likely you're going to see that with peripheral causes. Um, is there nausea? You know, sweating, things like that. Again, you can kind of see that in both. Nystagmus is going to be an interesting finding, and you will get you know kudos if you can pick this up on your exam. Um, vertical nystagmus is is almost always going to be central. So if you see vertical nystagmus on your exam, slam dunk this person's going for an MRI. Um, are the symptoms fatigable? So the so if you see nystagmus on exam, or if you have a little bit of dizziness, does it fade with um, you know ch does do this are the symptoms fatigable? So you know if you do the Dix Hall Pike maneuver, for example, with with someone with peripheral vertigo, you're going to see the nystagmus go away after you keep doing it. Um, or, you know, for a patient who's having, you know, a peripheral cause, the dizziness might go away if they're lying still or if they're sitting down and they're not moving. Whereas with central cause, it's, it's going to be pretty persistent. Um, is there hearing loss or, or ringing in the ears? That's also going to be a big, that's going to cue you into a peripheral cause, something that's directly affecting cranial nerve eight. Um, abnormal tympanic membrane. Please, please, please look in the ears. Make sure there's not a gynotitis media or a gynotitis external or that the tympanic membrane isn't covered in vesicles. So that's gonna be you know, a big finding that you definitely wanna take a look at. So always look at the ears. Um, and the cranial nerve findings, the neuro exam. Make sure you do a full cranial nerve assessment. Every single patient that comes into your ED with dizziness has bought themselves a full cranial nerve exam, a full neuro exam. I don't care if this person is coming in 
with AFib and you're certain this is just, you know, palpitations and, you know, syncope, do a full neuro exam because you're going to, you're going to miss things if you don't. Next. So specifically with regards to the new exam, you really want to make sure, so you went to the cranial nerves, but you also really want to make sure that you're picking up on these posterior symptoms. So these are the Ds that are that we see with regards to posterior stroke, because that's the important thing, right? There's a reason why we have to do all these exams, because these, so the vertigo, it's, if we're really worried this is a central cause, it's going to be a posterior or a cerebellar stroke which doesn't show up really well on a CAT scan. So a non-con CT isn't going to pick these up as well as an MRI is. So we're really deciding whether or not this patient can go home after a normal CT or if we're gonna commit them to getting a full MRI. So it's really, really important that every single one of these patients, you're going through these Ds. So dizziness, number one, the vertigo. Are they having double vision, diplopia? Dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, that's a big one. Um, dysarthria, difficulty speaking, slurred speech. And that can also be seen with um, like the frontal or temporal lobe CBAs as well, but stuff, something you want to pick up, absolutely. Dystiadocokinesia. If you are a med student, you come to me and you tell me that this patient has positive dystiadocokinesia and that you did the exam, that's automatic gold star. You get an A in my book because, you know, kudos to you and double kudos if you can say it without stuttering. Um, that's the rapid alternating movements. So you really want to make sure, and also gait, gait isn't on here, but walk these patients. Every single one of these patients needs to be walked. Every single patient coming in with dizziness, my third question to you is going to be, can they walk? Did you walk them? And so that's, that's going to be the only finding. As a med student, I had a patient, um, this is a pretty, you know, this is a really sad case. Honestly, this patient had been sitting in the ED for nearly 12 hours, and they've been signed out from team to team. And as a med student, they told me, you know, I heard the sign out was, this guy's homeless, he's looking for a place to sleep, go in there, you know, tell him it's time to go. So I go in there and I'm talking to this guy. And the more I talk to him, I realize I'm like, it doesn't really sound like an open and shut, you know, case of someone who just needs a place to sleep and come to find out he has a job and come to find out he used to work on a boat. So he's probably really balanced and probably doesn't typically complain of something like vertigo. If you have vertigo, you probably don't work on a boat because you can't think of anything worse. And finally I said, well, can you walk? And I stand him up and he is really not, and just, just a staggering gait of someone who was just really focused really, really hard on trying to get his legs to move in a coordinated fashion. And I go back to my attending and I say, or my resident at the time, and I'm like, this guy can't walk. I don't think this is, you know, I don't think this is a open and shut, you know, ED border case. And yeah, he went straight to MRI and had a stroke. So. And that's something, and so it's really hard. You really got to make sure you're not anchoring. And so, you know, and it's going to be difficult because, yeah, and that's a good point in the comments. Ask for help. Make sure you're standing right next to them. Make sure this patient isn't going to like fall and hurt themselves. Um, but, you know, sometimes these cases are going to be uncomfortable, right? It might be a homeless patient. It might be someone who doesn't smell very good or isn't very clean. You might not want to get in close to do a full neuro exam. You might not want to you know, help them up or touch them and help them walk. But the fact of the matter is we miss serious, serious diagnoses all the time because we didn't want to touch the patient, because we didn't want to get up close and personal with the patient, and because we didn't want to sit and talk to them for a while. Um, but that's our job. That's our job as emergency medicine physicians. It's to catch these, you know, can't miss diagnoses. Next page. And so finally, what tests are we going to order? For the most part, you know, a lot of these cases are going, so clear cut vertigo is frequently going to be a peripheral cause and may not need any labs. However, you know, if it's someone that may be having like a post viral syndrome, in general, I always get labs in these patients. They're always, they always come in and they're like, you know, if there's anyone over the age of 30 and they're coming complaining of dizziness, you get, you buy yourself some labs. So I get a basic CBC, make sure that, you know, they're, they're not anemic, you know, basic metabolic panel. Basically want to make sure their sodium isn't crazy out of whack. B12 is another, B12 on folate. So you want to think about, you know, metabolic etiologies. B12 can absolutely cause some gait abnormalities. Um, you know, if you're having an alcoholic, it's going to be like, you know, a, you know, encephalitis type picture. So you want to make sure, I get, I get basic set of labs and obviously finger stick glucose, first thing you want to get. EKG, 
you know, even if they're not having chest pain, dizziness, you buy yourself an EKG in my book. Not every attending may feel the same, but I get an EKG just to make sure we're not missing an arrhythmia. Um, and that, you know, what they're calling dizziness isn't actually syncope or presyncope due to, an, due to an, uh, an arrhythmia. And then frequently these patients are going to get some imaging and that's going to be, and again, whether or not we get imaging is going to be 100% dependent on your exam. And that's really going to be the neuro exam. If you do a full neuro exam, they have, they don't have a single neuro deficit. They're running laps around the room. They've got no double vision. They've got no, you know, pronator drift and they're young and healthy, they're not a smoker, no CVA risks. All right, maybe they don't need a CAT scan, maybe they don't need an MRI, but it really does come down to your exam. There's no way around it. And like I said, the CAT scan is not going to catch these posterior strokes. So when we do our exam, we're really deciding, does this person need an MRI or not? And that's a big commitment depending on your hospital. That may be that may buy you an admission depending on your hospital, um, depending on how long it takes you to get an MRI. So. It's really important, and as a med student, you 100% because you're going to have the most time to do these exams. So it, you know, you can really look like a rock star by going in and say, "I did a full neuro exam. I, you know, caught the pronator drift, or I noticed the nystagmus," and that's going to be huge. So you should get excited when you see a dizziness patient. That's that's that. Hello, my name is Marquita Norman, and I am uh, Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Wake Forest uh, School of Medicine and current chair of the uh, SAM Equity and Inclusion Committee. Hi, my name is uh, Chris A. Miguel. I am uh, an assistant professor at Ohio State University, and I'm the current clerkship director there. We're going to be talking to you about fever. Um, and just a couple cases ago, uh, we're going to do this kind of in a give and take kind of format. Uh, so I'm going to be playing the part of the learner here. Okay, so Miss Smith is a 78 year old female uh, presenting from her skilled nursing facility for chills today. Uh, next slide. So she's had uh, two days of chills and uh, elevated uh, temperature, um, reporting some mild dyspnea, but no coughing. Uh, nausea, but no vomiting, um, and she is currently bed bound from MS uh, and intermittently straight cast for urine. So as I'm thinking about going to see this patient, can we go back a slide, please? Thanks. Um, I am uh, kind of getting my mindset. Maybe this is information that I got from the nursing note and from the chart. Um, I'm concerned that she has some sort of infection uh, causing her elevated temperature. So I'm going to direct my history and physical exam towards kind of finding that source. Uh, so can I uh, talk to the patient? Um, yes, you can. All right, ma'am, what brings you into the emergency room today? Uh, yeah, I'm just not feeling well. Um, uh, the nurses at the facility told me I uh, have a fever and I'm just, um, just really sick. Okay. Do you know how high your temperature has been? You know, I'm really not sure. Um, they just said it was high and they sent me here. Gotcha. Okay. Well, um, it's been going on for two days, you said. Is that right? Yeah, it, it really, it, it has. I mean, it's, I have some, I feel cold all the time, uh, but, um, you know, I, I just don't, don't feel well. Okay. Uh, so we're going to kind of go from head to toe and see if we can figure out if you're having any other symptoms with this, okay? Okay. Uh, have you been having any headaches? Um, maybe a little bit. Okay. Any runny nose? Mm, no. Sore throat? No sore throat. Pain in your ears at all? No, no ear pain. Okay. Any neck pain? Um, no, no neck pain. Just okay. achy. I just feel achy. Are you able to turn your neck all around? Yeah, I can move my neck all around. Great. Um, I didn't think the nurses asked you, but I just want to make sure. Um, have you had any kind of a cough? Uh, no cough, but I do feel a little short of breath. Okay. Any pain in your chest? No chest pain. Um, any pain or injuries to your arm that you know about? Either arm? No, I haven't had any. 
any falls or anything, no arm pain. I just feel like achy all over though. Gotcha. Uh, any abdominal pain? No, not, no, it just, I just don't feel, I feel like I'm going to throw up, but I haven't been able to. Okay. Um, any diarrhea? Not that I recall, maybe some, you know, loose stool, but I don't think it was diarrhea. Okay. Was there any blood in it? Um, no, I don't remember any blood, but my nurses would know. I never, I don't, um, really look down okay. there. Uh, and I understand that you um, need to get cast in order to urinate. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't. I I'm, I have very limited uh, movement, so my uh, the nurses help me out uh, a lot. Um, so okay. they they assist me in uh, straight cast. Okay. Have any of them noted or mentioned at all that the the appearance of the urine is different, or that there's a strange odor or anything like that? No, they haven't. Um, they said, you know, I, I'm, uh, you know, currently being treated for, um, you know, something on my backside, but they, you know, I can't see wound care for that. Okay, what's going on with your backside? Oh, they, I, I have a little wound there because I, you know, um, I think it, they call it a, an ulcer. Okay, do you know, um, do you have sensation in that area? Um, very, very little. Okay. Um, have your nurses noticed or told you, or have you noticed that the drainage has changed at all? Um, they haven't mentioned it. Okay. All right. And then any um, rashes or anything like that or pain in your legs other than the general achiness you were talking about? No, not that, not that I can tell. Okay. All right. So uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So kind of based on the history, the biggest areas that I'm worried about are going to be this um, wound on the patient's backside, or this could certainly still be a urinary tract infection or kind of a general viral infection, um, but nothing too telling from the history. Um, clearly, we have a picture of what's going on on the backside here. Uh, is there anything else on abdominal exam with the patient? Is there any tenderness? No, no, no focal tenderness on examination. No mass is appreciated. All right. And uh, anything when I listen to the lungs? Uh, no clear lung sounds. Okay. So uh, we can see the patient's vitals here. It looks like she's currently febrile. Um, she's a little bit tachycardic and her blood pressure is a little bit soft. I'd probably want to look in her chart and see if that's normally where she runs or uh, a change for her. And she's a little bit tachypneic too. So I'm a little bit worried that we're seeing signs of a systemic infection. And with uh, the appearance of this ulcer, it looks like there's certainly surrounding cellulitis and uh, evidence of kind of purulent discharge. So I'm worried that this might be our source. Can we go to the next slide? So we're not going to quite put all of our eggs in one basket um, with the workup, since the patient does seem like she's heading more towards the sick side of the spectrum than the not sick. So I'm still going to get a chest x-ray. I'm definitely going to check the patient's urine since she gets cath. Um, we're going to check a CBC, a chemistry, and a lactate. Um, but I definitely want to get a CT scan of our pelvis and see if there's an abscess that's developed. Um, and see if there's maybe some bony involvement in the infection, see if there's signs of osteomyelitis. Um, and while we're doing that, I'll probably treat her fever with some Tylenol, give her some fluids and some broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So as we uh, approach fever, uh, we want to look for the um, infections first. Um, utilize the uh, good history and physical examination to localize the infection, recognizing that, uh, as Dr. Rendon mentioned, you want to avoid uh, premature closure. So you don't want to narrow in that focus. You want to make sure that you keep it uh, broad, but um, try to think about where could this infection be. Um, if, if the person is sick um, or the source is unclear, consider uh, broad spectrum um, involvement, including broad spectrum uh, antibiotics uh, early. Um, 
And then uh, once you develop, notice the uh, site of infection, uh, evaluate the patient characteristics and uh, severity uh, all help to determine the uh, disposition of the patient. Is this patient going home? Um, you know, and someone this sick, you know they're not going home. Right now you're trying to decide, are they gonna need the ICU versus, you know, are you gonna be able to resuscitate them well enough to, you know, be stable for the floor? Um, and that's always helpful um, when you're uh, talking to your uh, team and you're attending and resident. To, if, if you're already thinking those few steps ahead, like, you know, we're resuscitating this patient, but this is my, you know, ultimately this patient was going to be admitted. And this is what I need in place in order to admit this patient here versus here. That just shows that level, that higher level of thinking uh, as a resident. Yeah, and just like the last chief complaint we're talking about with vertigo, I really like uh, fever as a chief complaint um, because there's a huge like range of things that you're going to do. Um, you can do like absolutely nothing and send a patient home, um, or you could be doing lots of things and be sending a patient to the OR or to the ICU. So um, I think your history and physical exam, along with your patient characteristics, really help drive how much of a workup you need to get. Um, in somebody like this, who's like I said, kind of bordering on that in the definite sick category, they're definitely going to get a lot more done um, than like a 20 year old who comes in and is febrile and maybe their heart rate's like 110, um, but they have the flu and are otherwise like running laps around the department. And there's somebody who's probably not going to get much of a workup other than a COVID test these days. But uh, next slide. And I think it gets really interesting when we start thinking about um, fever, and I'm going to add in a term hyperthermia. So when we say fever, what we really mean is elevated in blood temperature or elevation in body temperature, secondary to your hypothalamus, increasing your body's set temperature as a result of an infection. But we don't really know that at the time that we see you and you check into the hospital, check into the emergency department. We assume that's what it is because maybe 80 to 90 percent of the time that's what in fact the problem is but if you're seeing the patient and you're doing your history and your physical exam and they are not fitting into this category of an infection especially if they they're having like subacute episodes of elevated temperature then you need to start thinking a little bit outside of the infectious box and think about other things that cause elevated temperature um, if you're a mnemonics person uh, I made up this mnemonic of motives. It's not like super helpful, um, but uh, it does help you maybe organize a little bit. The big things that I think about are all kind of written here. You can read about them, but um, if I'm thinking that I'm seeing a patient with hyperthermia rather than fever, this starts to be kind of the pathway that I go down in tailoring my history and physical exam and my workup. And I also want to mention that um, as we think about, um, you know, sources of fever, uh, the skin is the largest organ. We need to be uh, uncovering our patients and looking at every portion of the skin, particularly for our elderly patients and our diabetics, including uh, evaluating the groin areas to make sure we're not missing a potential forniers um, or, um, or something, uh, you know, a, a other other type of cellulitis. I mean, um, because, um, and then look under the bandage. Um, I can't stress that enough <laughs> because uh, that is where a lot of infections lie. Yeah, definitely agree. Uh, and you can go on to the final slide here. Okay, I want to thank the presenters for providing this key information that will help you when evaluating patients in the emergency department. Next slide. If you would like to unmute now, um, we will have a Q&A session with our presenters. Unmute yourselves, questions. Clearly someone must have a question out there your opportunity to talk with this great panel of educators from across the country. While someone is waiting for that question, um, Dr. Norman, is there anything from the chat that you would like to share with us? 
Uh, I am monitoring the chat. Um, there were questions asked earlier um, that were uh, answered, but if other other uh, panelists would like to answer them, that would be great. Um, uh, one of our students asked if uh, typically do you want your med students to ask patients in their initial interviews uh, uh, if they're okay with pelvic exams, um, you know, if they think they need to do a pelvic exam. Um, I'd say a good rule of thumb, even when you're a resident too, um, is to always give yourself an out. And so, you know, I, my go-to like uh, verbiage was always, I got to go talk to the boss, but I think we may need to do X, Y, or Z. Are you okay with that? If they agree with me. And that way the patient doesn't get kind of like upset if one way um, you ultimately decide not to do the exam. And I say, well, he said that I was going to need to use it or need, you know, pelvic or whatever. Why do I all of a sudden not need it? Um, and also it lets you kind of save face a little bit. Yeah, even I was an attending, like, I don't know, maybe the resident caught something I missed or may have already said something to them. So I just never, as a rule, I said, I'm going to talk to the other doctor I'm working with. So as a student, I would definitely just um, would do the same. That said, I think there's um, something to be said for, you know, preparing for what, anticipating what's going to happen next. So if you have a patient coming in with rectal bleeding and you know they're gonna need a guaiac, go get the guaiac stuff and make sure it's set up. You might, you know, and let me know as the attendant, like, hey, I don't know if you're gonna do it, but if you if we're gonna do it, we have it all set up. Or, you know, just in case I put the patient in the GYN room in case we're gonna do the pelvic. Little things like that are really, you know, top notch and let me know that you're thinking critically about next steps and, and the management of the patient and, and moving things along. Another question that um, kind of came up uh, just in a private message to myself, but maybe I can ask my colleagues um, and pick your brains. Um, you know, for the patient that comes in and they give you lots of information, right? They're like pan positive for every single question you ask. You know, do your teeth itch? They're like, yes, it does, right? All these things. Um, what are what's some advice we can give our students on how to really get to the heart? Of why the patient is coming in so they're not reporting a like 30 minute um, novel of what the patient literally just told them. So I, I have been uh, known to ask my patient, uh, when you left the house, what were you most concerned about? Uh, because at least to figure out what they were most concerned about so we can at least address that issue and then recognize that some things may not be addressed today um, and, and just uh, manage those expectations, um, saying, okay, I recognize this, you know, this is the most important thing you're concerned about. We need to address this because this is the most emergent. Um, I think these other things may be able to be addressed by your primary care. If you don't have one, let's assist in finding that person for you um, and, and kind of just, like I said, overall managing expectations. First, first. I think that's the name of the game when it comes to emergency medicine. Worst first, if the patient's saying, my foot hurts and my arm is sore and also I have chest pain and also stop, hey, let's talk about that chest pain. Like, think about what could possibly kill the patient, what's going to change management, what we definitely need to rule out and try to hone in on that. Now, if the patient goes back and says, well, my chest doesn't really hurt all that much. What I really came in for is because, you know, you know, my legs are swollen or something like that. Then, you know, I, I agree with, with Marquita, just, you know, I love to ask, what made you come to the emergency room today? And I emphasize the word emergency. So they get to thinking about what felt emergent about your visit today. And sometimes that'll kind of help them kind of redirect, but sometimes it's just hard. Yeah, and then, you know, with along the lines of that, like teasing out chronicity, again, like what's new today? What changed today? And then also the chart is your friend, right? Like all those medical records are there. so. Don't sit down and start telling me about this thing that's been going on and they just had an MRI yesterday. So utilize the resources you have. Yeah, I think this is really hard for um, the medical student level to kind of tease through what is the important complaint and like where is like the hidden like danger and the 15 things the patient's telling you. Um, so I think it, at the medical school level, it's definitely better to err on the side of getting more information than getting less. Um, especially if you're talking about things like chest pain or abdominal pain. Um, 
even if the patient's there because their like foot's hurting, you know, I as the attending, I still need to know like everything else I told you about the chest pain in order to know that it is or isn't important to chase down. So I think it's okay to spend a few more minutes in the room getting that information. And maybe you can tell me, hey, um, they have a lot of complaints, they're like pan positive. I'm gonna give you like the thing that I think is most pressing and let me ask questions to get like the additional information if I, if I need it. The hour session is quickly coming to an end. I wanna give one more opportunity for any of our attendees to either put one last question in the chat or unmute themselves and ask a question. If there are no questions, we will ask each of our panelists to give us one last pearl um, that will help us when evaluating patients in the emergency department. I'll start, Dr. Pierce. Um, I kind of alluded to this earlier at the very beginning of the talk, which is ways to shine on your rotation uh, because you're always being evaluated, uh, whether, you, uh, whether it's a formal interview or not, you're always being evaluated. Uh, but, but one way to really stand out is to share, uh, share some of your knowledge with the residents and with, your, and with the attendings. Um, we, I always appreciate it when I have students who share pearls and tidbits with me. If we have like a minute or two of downtime, please feel comfortable sharing an interesting case or something you've learned recently. Uh, and that only helps kind of the residents and the attendings stay sharp, but it also shows that uh, you're enthusiastic about emergency medicine, you're enthusiastic about learning and sharing knowledge. And that's a lot of our specialty is sharing our knowledge with our colleagues and with other learners. So that would be my pearl. Thank you, Dr. Rendon. Holly jumping next then, uh, Dr. Pierce. So I think um, a few things. One is to realize that it's okay if you don't know the answer for our students, right? When you go into the room, we're not expecting you to like say, this is the number one diagnosis and it's definitely a PE, right? Because these are some of the elusive uh, life-threatening diagnoses that we're trying to save our patients from um, on a daily basis, right? So I think having grace on yourself to go home after you see a chief complaint and really learn, right? Compare and contrast those chief complaints for example, pneumonia versus uh, PE versus, um, you know, COVID, for example, right? What are the similarities and what are the differences? Because that'll really help you to figure out those nuances and really get better at um, honing just based on the history and physical exam, your uh, differential diagnosis. Um, I think a lot of times in medicine, we put everything on the diagnostics, on the labs and imaging, and all the research says, you know, we get to like 80% of the diagnosis just based on history and physical exam alone, right? So pretend those diagnostics don't ex exist and ask your patient, you know, what's going on? And if you don't know, go back into the room and figure it out again, right? Start over and ask those questions um, before you present to your team. So you can really at least have a working differential diagnosis that you can share with us. And then also share your mental uh, thought process on why you think something is more likely or less likely so we can really understand. Um, it's great if you rattle off all the threats, right? But a patient does not have a pneumothorax and a dissection and a <laughs> esophageal rupture, right? So what do they actually, what do you think is most likely? Um, I think that really helps you um, to show your knowledge and helps us as a team to uh, take care of that patient. Um, this is Ashley, I guess I can go. Um, so, you know, you're going to be learning forever. Medicine, it's, it's a slow growing process and um, you're not going to know everything. And so I would say, especially as a four, um, the things that you can do, and we kind of talked about this, is, this already, is if, you know, they say they're going to do a bedside ultrasound, then grab the machine and put it in the room. If the patient needs to be PO challenged or nobody's brought them water yet, go get it. I don't want to have to ask you, how's your patient in 17? You should say, I already went by, their pain's controlled, or they're not vomiting, or they threw up. So just, you don't have that many patients, try and stay on top of them and just help sort of be more efficient and move the team along. And no one expects you to know everything. Just be ready to defend your thought process, like um, Dr. Nadation said. Um, but that's all I got. I guess my pro would be be curious. So, you know, it's so easy to get kind of jaded and, you know, every chest pain you see it and it becomes very routine, like the farther you get along. But as a medical student, I used to say, okay, what's the worst thing this could be? And I used to start every, like, before I go see a patient, I would think, okay, what's the worst thing? Or what's the most interesting thing this could be? And I would go in from that standpoint of thinking of myself as like an investigator and someone who, and as a med student, you're, you're, you're in a privileged position because just by virtue of the fact that you have two patients, you have 
a lot of time. You have so much time to just go and ask all the boring questions. Ask the patient, what do you do? Where do you live? You know, and I, be curious bench and really take ownership really kind of because it, this is your patient. I have as an attending, I have exactly two minutes to talk to this patient and do a physical exam before I have to move on to the next thing. You have 20 minutes, use all those 20 minutes, go back, look it up, you know, broaden your differential, go back, ask another question, do another physical exam finding, be curious, be, be interesting. And I, I love when, when med students come to me and say, it's probably not this, but I'm thinking about it. Like that lets, that's, you know, and, and it keeps it fun. It makes it interesting. And you're going to catch, you're going to catch some zebras. I definitely caught zebras. I probably caught more zebras as a med student than I, than I do now, to be honest, because I just had the time to do so. So um, I will look at it from that standpoint and know that, you know, you're protected because you're a med student. You've got several layers of protection above you've got the residents and you've got the attending who are all kind of going over and making sure that you're not going to, you know, you're not going to kill anyone because, you, you know, you're not really allowed to do anything. So really take advantage of the fact that this is your patient. There's literally no risk. It's only opportunity for reward. So do all the things and be and, and get excited about it. Um, I think for me, I had an attending once who told me, I'll believe anything you say as long as you're organized. So when you're presenting a patient, um, you know, just try and start from the top and do the same thing every time. Um, and that way you can really kind of not forget things. And then when you have a case where you have a pan positive review of systems, committing, I think is really important. So, you know, see if you can, you know, like um, Dr. Tiffany was saying, if you can put a story together and you're an investigator, so try and make the most sense of it for you. And that's all you can do. And I love it when I hear from a student, here's what I think is going on and why. And when they're committing on what they're doing, I think that shows that you're, you know, you're thinking through a thought process. You could be wrong. You know, we're wrong a lot of the times too. And that's how, that's how we do our job where we try and investigate what's going on, but just really commit and go down one pathway and then just be open to learning about, you know, why, what you could have done a little bit differently. And when you're asking for feedback, I, I encourage you to say, you know, what can I be doing differently or better? Because it's really easy for someone to just say, oh, you did a good job, but just ask, you know, specific portions or is this part of the history that I took okay? Or, you know, how could I have pieced this better together? So that's my advice. I also agree that uh, commitment to the process uh, is key. Um, I, you know, I have a, a good colleague and a friend who said MD means make decision. Uh, you need to be willing to commit to a decision. Um, you are, you know, you, you can obtain a history and physical, but, you know, processing that information and organizing it in a way that um, leads to patient care is what that next step, step is. And what we wanna know a lot of times is you know, that higher level of thinking, because um, it helps us in determining where, how we can help you navigate through uh, to the next step. So um, I just feel like, you know, just be willing to commit to a, to a differential, be willing to commit to a, a, a plan of care. And if you're wrong, it's okay. Um, as Dr. Mitchell mentioned, uh, there are multiple layers of protection there, okay, but, it, but it's only going to help you grow uh, as a student and ultimately as a, as a physician. Uh, I think my pearl's been said a couple of times, but I just want to explicitly reiterate, you can go back into the room. Uh, my life changed completely when I realized that life isn't an OSCE. And when I came out of the room, if I thought of something that was really important, you can go back in and ask. If you come out and you think they have appendicitis and you're reading about it before you're presenting and you read about the Robsing sign, but you didn't try that, go back and try it before you present. Um, so I think knowing that and that you don't have to get it all right the first time necessarily um, is really helpful and kind of takes the pressure out. Great, I wanna thank everyone for those pearls and thank you to our participants for joining us tonight and taking time away from your busy schedules um, to help with this webinar. And to attendees, we wanna thank you for coming tonight and we really look forward to the bright futures you have in emergency medicine. We know this year has been a challenging year, but you know, know that we're all working to help you be successful. So thanks everyone.